why is this so hard, you know? So we we've, we've went to the moon, we, we've got existence proof there, we've now spent 40 plus years, you know, trying to duplicate that, that feat. Um, so what's the missing piece here? We thought for a while it was, you know, presidential direction, then we got that and that didn't work. We thought that, that maybe it was technology, but it looks like the technology thing is, is doable. So, so what is the, the missing element here that, or the missing, you know, secret sauce that it's going to take to, uh, to get us back to the moon? We got seduced by this idea that the government was our, the place to do it. You know, we tried to outrush the Russians. We did, but you can only do that for so long, and it was not in keeping with the American character, which is the government, as Abraham Lincoln said, and I'm not against the government doing this, Abraham Lincoln called this internal improvements, and it was a controversial subject in 1860, but it helped build a railroad across America, it helped build canals across New York. But it was always government in the service of the people and private enterprise and economic growth, which, oh, by the way, brings tax dollars back into the government so they can continue the cycle. The government is the ultimate investor. And we forgot that with the policy. And lately we've had a shift in the mindset simply because we have people like Elon Musk who has his own money, Jeff Bezos who has his own money, and people who are who are blazing their own path with or without the government. And so it, it's, it's time for us to rethink it, and we haven't really rethought it yet. First of all, what can we do about this? Um, make Charles Miller have our desk. <laughs> because Charles has been pushing private partnerships um, for a long, long time, and he's been doing it effectively, and he's been doing it within the government and within NASA, which is astonishing. But um, a couple of days ago, I got a phone call from Taylor Dinnerman. Taylor Dinnerman uh, writes for the Wall Street Journal on a regular basis, and Buzz Aldrin introduced me to Taylor about 12 years ago. And I was sitting, sitting in a cab on my way to the airport, and ta I, I told Taylor I was coming out here to recommend rapid reinvention of NASA. And when I explained how it worked, Taylor said, oh, so you're gonna put Goddard Space Flight uh, out of the center, out of business? Oh, are you gonna put the following 27,000 people in Alabama out of business? Are you gonna put the 20,000 people in Mississippi out of business? There is a simple answer that I didn't give Taylor. Do we have a jobs program or a space program? If we have a jobs program, put that under the Department of Labor and keep your 57,000 people Employed. But if we have a space program, let's get back to space. We've had, ever since 2011, America has been embarrassed and has been covered up for it. We haven't had access to space in American vehicles for American citizens. We haven't had it, it hasn't existed. We've only gotten our humans into space with Russian vehicles and even many of the objects we get into space. The big sophisticated satellites go up with rockets that are disguised as American rockets, but have Russian engines. It's time to overcome this embarrassment, put your jobs program wherever you want, take it out of my face. I want space. <laughs> okay, anybody else? Um, yeah, I think the biggest fundamental problem is, and despite the fact they're very good advocates for commercial space, uh, including myself for many years, screaming loudly, uh, there's been a lack of political realism on that side of the fence to face the uh, significant power of regionalism and traditionalism uh, in D.C. Uh, I had kind of an education by fire there uh, during the transition team, and then after the transition team, I served the White House Bay as a match for a while. I believe there is a way forward, um, but it's not just uh, attacking the fortress uh, head on, um, uh, you know, and, and hoping that you'll break through the door. Um, but, but we've done that over and over and over. You know, when I, I got to NASA, I people come to me and say, oh, good, a commercial space, I want you to know I've been here for 10 years fighting for this. And somebody else, I've been here for 20 years fighting for this. I've been here for 30 years fighting for this. You know, we, we've got to get past the fighting men. I'm not about the jobs program, but if you start out a conversation saying, I am going to lay off 27,000 people in Huntsville, Alabama, that is the end of the conversation. I guarantee you're not getting it. We've got to find a way to make those people working on something that is efficient and go forward constructive.
there's nobody in this administration or in the way Congress wants that to happen. There is a way for it, but it's going to have to be an and solution, and it's not going to make everybody entirely happy because it could be simple. It could be so much more efficient to get this done. Nineteen billion dollars is not a lot in the federal budget at all. Like I said, the key is creating a sustainable space economy that pays and taxes back to government. We heard talk about no gravity on tax. I suggest government will like these businesses more and support them and defend them and their contributors to the infrastructure that they use. These companies will have a vested interest in that infrastructure and making sure it's used correctly. So I believe that it is appropriate to charge these companies fees and or tax them, but only if that money is specifically allocated to go back to space and that works. So this is, this is it's easy to say and it's clear to large majority of people that what's going on now doesn't work. Just, just, just to state the obvious. The hard part is how to solve all the problems of getting to something that is working. Um, and this is driven because we are so tied up with a government agency. At the center of this, it's, it's, it's completely driven by politics. And politics always wins. And so there's, anybody bringing a plan to the table has to also figure out how they're going to solve the problem. Right? I, I know quite a few people who work on SLS. Most of them know, not everyone, most of them know that it's a dead end program. That's just a job. They most of them know that. But it pays their bills, it pays their mortgage, and it's putting their kids to college. And that's for many of them is their first priority is to their family and taking care of their kids and paying them. So they are going to, you don't mess with somebody's life. That, you know, it's, it's not enough to say, well, this is not getting in place in more space. There's tens of thousands of people with jobs depend on this. Anybody proposing a plan needs to solve what are you going to do about all those people in Huntsville? What are you going to give them to do that is much more useful than building a super expensive project? They would, most of them would like to do something else. So as we start developing and talking about what we're against, we also have to talk about what we're for and how we're going to solve any of these different problems. Um, I, with my, my dear friend Dr. Audrey here, presented some solutions, some of these in the uh, transition team. We're not going to talk about them publicly here um, uh, at, at, uh, at, in this uh, conference, but there are some... <laughs> what? <laughs> so there are solutions to these problems. You can cut a deal with a Senator Shelby. He's very transactional and he says what's in it for the state of Alabama. And he's also a patriot too, so you can appeal to how it's Alabama's interests are taken into account, and it's also better for the nation. I think you can get into a deal that advances the nation and gets us out of this um, dead end space program. Accountability would help. <clears throat> also, uh, structuring the problem, the objective function correctly. Uh, if you don't know what you want, <laughs> you know, you'll pay for uh, what you don't want. Um, NASA has been canceling good programs and paying for bad programs for a while. But if you reward failure with a payment, uh, the X-33 program, Lockheed, was going to make a reusable launch vehicle. They got paid $2 billion to fail. Um, you know, if they didn't get paid anything, they, they might have thought harder about how to succeed. You know, if the $2 billion payment actually had a criteria of making the vehicle fly, they might have uh, had a higher rate of success. How many people know what SLI was, Space Launch Initiative? That's, that, that's pretty good. Uh, <laughs> NASA was working, for those of you that don't know what SLI was, NASA was actually paying for a replacement per show. They were working on replacing it before it, before it died, and uh, and that got canceled. <coughs> I found out about it because the guy that ran that program was a Colorado School of graduate. He was a fellow member of, uh, on the senior advisory board for Raytheon. And Raytheon was developing a reusable uh, lunar architecture based on lunar resources. 
that was the CEO process. Uh, another thing that got canceled, uh, another failure that was actually very successful. Uh, um, nobody saw the CEO presentations, except for the contractors. They showed them to each other. Nobody from NASA went to the uh, briefings on that. Um, people ask how, you know, ask me, uh, late people ask me frequently, how far, how many years have we away from the moon? And how many years have we away from, away from humans to Mars? And uh, I answer uh, that it's the wrong question, it's the wrong metric. We're not years away other than the start time, the lag time. We're dollars away. We're 20 billion, 25 billion dollars I've been telling people. Charles says it's 10. Maybe you know, we can go to the North and South Pole the moon and do both with you know, 20. Uh, uh, 20 billion dollars away from the moon, from humans on the moon, or 50 billion dollars away from humans on Mars. So, and, and one of the questions that, that I've seen <coughs> asked many times over the years is, what is the long-term goal of human spaceflight? You know, why are we doing this? We're spending a lot of the taxpayers' money to do this, so, so what is the end goal? I've heard members of Congress pleading with somebody to answer that question. Um, and so we did some workshops, some of us were, were there in Washington in, in 2015 when we tried to, to do, to answer that question. And so this idea of a, of a thriving space economy came, came out of that, of that workshop in Washington in, in 2015. And more interestingly, in the recent, most recent NASA authorization, it actually made it into legislation, which I think is the first time I've ever remember seeing it. So those of you that study these things more than I do. So how big a deal do you think that is? And do you think this was just a throwaway line? Or do you think people are becoming serious about the idea of making money in, in space? And there's something looming very, very big in Asia that we're very unaware of, and it's the new, the new Silk Road. China's massive hundred billion dollar transportation architecture that goes all the way from uh, China to Barcelona and Spain and England. And uh, they bought a great tradition. It's a trillion dollars. Oh, it's a trillion dollars. All right, amazing. Well, one way or the other, they're spending a lot of money. They're buying up ports. Um, if you've ever heard of a town called Athens in Greece, um, home of Plato, Aristotle, a few people like that, um, it has always uh, functioned via a port called Piraeus. Guess who owns Piraeus for all practical purposes now? Uh, the Chinese do. It's part of their new Silk Road. So are many, many, many other ports whose names you've heard of for a long, long time. This is going to, this is going to put China in the lead position as the leading nation in the world in what it calls its new world order uh, for the next 50 years. Our only edge is that while they are developing a terrestrial uh, commercial corridor that will give them control of the world's commerce, um, we, through Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and uh, Bob Bigelow, we're developing another highway, a highway in the sky. And, but our highway in the sky is going to take 30 years to deliver, deliver economically. The Chinese New Silk Road is already delivering economically. They made their first delivery approximately six months ago from a Chinese city that is a, where, a warehouse city to Spain. It took two weeks, and they intend to replace every bit of track that that cargo traveled on with high-speed rail so that in a few years, it'll take two days. We have the highway in the sky that brings us the space economy, but it's going to take time before that space economy delivers over from, from a leadership point of view. Somebody in the lead has to recognize that we're in a race with China. Somebody in the lead has to recognize there's a horse in this race. It's called the Belt and Road, the New Silk Road. And, the, and then we have to have a horse race in this race too. Or by the time we finish the administration of the current president, America will be a hazard. I underscore what was said here. And the important thing is that we don't oppose the Chinese because they're Chinese. Not at all. We oppose the Chinese because their government is a totalitarian dictatorship. And at this moment, we are at the point where human beings are going to establish civilization beyond Earth. And that's only going to happen once, and then it's going to flourish from there. And what values do we want to see leave the Earth? First, I want to see the values of the scientific revolution, the values of civil rights, the values of people like uh, Gandhi and Martin Luther King and Thoreau and Thomas Jefferson go to the, the universe. I do not want to see the values of Karl Marx and, uh, and Mao Zedong uh, 
go to the university. So if we frame it that way and we get our government excited, I think that's a powerful point of it. We've got to be careful not to frame it uh, as an ethnic thing. In fact, if you want to see a diverse human population space, the United States leading that is the only way for that to happen. If the Indians go to space, all the Indians. If the Chinese go to space, they'll all be Chinese. If you want to see diversity in space, uh, it needs to be the Americans. We need to take on that task. I think Charles mentioned setting up this shining city, uh, you know, uh, on the moon for us to all look up to the way that uh, the writing is spoken in, in spaces that are really, frankly, that way can get the political inertia uh, moving. There was always a throwaway line in the 1980s, and it was from George Keyword, who started talking about the economic development of the solar system. He brought this back up all the way from Cordner. That got put in, in codified uh, by uh, Dr. John Marburger Marber, by Marburger in 2005 in his uh, Goddard Symposium, where he talked about, and I think he was being a bit optimistic that it was settled policy that the economic development of the solar system is now American policy. So. In there, and you can actually see kind of a evolution over time inside of the government of people making these points. And you've made your points in the past. Charles has made his point, and there are people who have advocated it. I crossed swords with uh, people. I was able to uh, put a chapter about the economic development of the solar system in a book that was a space power <coughs> theory that was commissioned by Don Rumsfeld that we put out in 2007 of uh, the economic development of, of the solar system as the basis for our national power in the 21st century. Because if we don't have money, you can't pay for all those carriers. You can't pay for all these fiber planes. You can't pay for all this stuff if you don't continue to have a nation that is strong economically. And we have the opportunity with 9 billion people going to be living on the earth for just the next 33 years to be able to service those people with resources. I mean, I don't care how many ports they are own, if we run out of resources on the earth, and they don't really have a whole lot of crap to move around. Um, and so there, the resources of the solar system are so much greater. And I thought it was actually encouraging. I just saw something yesterday. NASA's mission to Psyche, the metal asteroid, has been moved up several years. Yeah. I, and I hate that it's still going to be this long, but it is going to be a brain changer when there is a NASA spacecraft in orbit around a metal asteroid. That's just going to look so wild. That's just amazing. And, and it's these kinds of things, and it's the young folks out there, it's like, and again, I want to go back. I don't want them to have gray hair sitting up here. Uh, I was talking with Jerome uh, and, and, and I forgot your name just a little bit ago, uh, talking about this for the future, and these guys want to help us do it. And whether or not the government does it, every indication we have of Jeff Bezos, we don't do it. He's going to do it no matter what the government does unless the stupid government just collapses. It's going to happen. Our goal should be doing everything we can to help support that and to do our part to help push, the, push it along like all of us have for the past 35 years. If there's anything in the last few years that's changed is what Bezos is doing. And um, in my opinion, I actually think Bezos is ahead of us right now. Um, uh, taking an existing expendable launch vehicle and retrofitting into reasonable launch vehicles <coughs> is suboptimal. If you come from a clean sheet of paper and build a fully reasonable launch vehicle from day one that way, that's what Bezos has done. So I, I actually think his low go slow is approach is he's he's uh, I think he's gonna leapfrog Elon and it's proof's gonna be putting how operable and rapid the turnaround these vehicles can do, but I suspect Bezos has the march on us. And that is gonna be that's the big competition. I, I just want to add a couple other things. Um, we could go a lot faster with the Musk and Davis with, with partnerships. Let industry lead, but we can accelerate them. And we can, uh, and there's a lesson learned in history that's uh, the right one. Americans invented flight. 
1903, the Wright brothers did. They, they actually perfected an operable airplane in 1905. It took them three years to get the U.S. government to, to pay them $25,000 in a contract from 1905 to 1908. And they were so pissed off the U.S. government, they went off in Paris in, in uh, uh, 1908. In, in uh, August of 1908, they apparently flew for their U.S. Army and, and, and demonstrated in Paris because they were commercial guys and they're going to do deals in, in uh, Europe. In August of 1908, they demonstrate flight. The Europeans were like totally blown away. They, they never believed that the Wright brothers were so far ahead. Eleven months later, Louis Boreau flew across the English Channel. Eleven months. And the Europeans, because they had a very vibrant entrepreneurial sector, backed by their governments, just blew America away because our government did nothing to help these American entrepreneurial geniuses. And their governments helped their entrepreneurs over there. And for many, for about two decades, America was not the leader in the world in aviation. It took us two decades to catch up. In World War I, Americans flew British and French designed airplanes because they were twice as fast and could fly about twice as high, and anybody flying an American plane in World War One would have been his destiny. So we could, that there is a real case to be made that public-private partnerships properly designed and have many options, and you know, the railroads, the specific railroad act, and many other things, there are many lessons of what works and what doesn't work, properly designed, that you can marry the best of entrepreneurs with the government and do much better than either on its own. So I worry, I know we can do better than Jeff, Jeff Bezos goes back to the moon. In fact, Jeff Bezos publicly says he doesn't want to do it on his own. He wants to do it in partnership with the U.S. government. His people are in Washington, D.C. saying they want to partner with NASA and, our, and the nation as a whole to open up the space frontier and to have millions of people living and working in space. I think there is, that is a, for those of you who are young, that's a completely audacious vision, but to give credit where credit is due, that's an O'Neillian vision that was invented in the 70s and 80s and the National Space Society when I was, didn't have to care and as a lot younger, that needs to be the calling sign of the L5 Society, millions of people living and working in space in the early 1980s. He has the vision, and I think the forward strategy is our nation partnering with the Jeff Bezos and Paul Allens and uh, Elon Musk of the world. And so I think uh, I'm actually very excited about the future of space development, industrialization, and settlement. And uh, and think I'm, I'm as optimistic as I've ever been. So you made a point. It's a very good one that you won't get anywhere unless you say what we're going to do with these 27,000 to 47,000 people who are working on the SLS and the Orion. And uh, you're you've been putting forth these architectures for the moon uh, for the last year. And they're if you look at the illustrations alone, they're very complex. They involve a lot of elements. Um, and most of those elements are not currently in development. What's your shopping list of elements you'd like to see for a permanent moon, Mars, space infrastructure that, so that could be done by the 47,000 people who are about to put out of work if indeed we manage to reinvent NASA? There was a, a, a time period when Lungfish decided they would uh, try flopping around on the shore for a while before they would go back into the ocean and I'm sure food was probably a competitive thing at that point in time. Uh, eventually enough lungfish tried it that some of them developed legs and became amphibians and uh, they went into a new environment. Uh, I think that humanity is uh, uh, standing on the thresholds of becoming the aliens that we've been talking about, uh, going to other uh, uh, solar systems and you know, exploring the galaxy. If, if they're not, if they don't exist, they can become them. Uh, I, I, I like the analogy of a, a crab or a, a clam growing a shell around itself. Uh, I see the exoskeleton of all the spaces uh, probably the organic extension of the human at some point in time. And uh, 
that what we're really doing is uh, you know, uh, uh, going into a new environment. And uh, the point of that uh, expedition uh, for the lungfish was to get a better meal. Uh, if, uh, if we don't walk away from that exchange with positive energy gain, which uh, uh, we call uh, economic return, uh, then uh, we're not going to be doing it for very long. But if we do walk away um, with a positive energy gain, we have a whole new environment that our technology allows us to move into to expand the human race. So I, I think it's a lot more normal than political moves. I think we're really at a, at a very great threshold in, the, in human history or in the history of the history of life. Yeah. So first of all, let's start with first principles. Uh, you have a bunch of very highly technically qualified very well-educated assets called people, uh, which are our, our fundamental, most valuable assets sitting in major pockets around the country around the asset sectors. Um, they, they want to be measured in jobs. So if you could turn those, those central areas, like Silicon Valley is around Stanford, into areas for leveraging much more economic growth rather than just one-for-one -one government jobs, you could make the case that if you change your strategy in those centers, um, and that and something that drove new commercial economic growth as well as the government funding, that you would get much higher job growth in those centers. So then there's, so you could say, Marshall and Goddard and JSC and Kennedy could become Silicon Valley's for space where there's a much more organic job growth that's on top of the government that's <coughs> going there. So what, what is the strategy that would do that? So I think what we need to do is have a complete transition away from a space exploration focus to a space industrialization initiative focus, a space development focus. And it changes your thinking. It's not about exploration, but it's about industrialization and economic development and making and building large new industries in space. You then do, you challenge NASA to reinvigorate and rethink the types of space projects that are doing. So let me just give you one example. You don't want them competing with private industry again. So you want them to go high risk industries. There's there's potential for very large economic growth, and they're, they're going to be a partner with industry. So let me just suggest one idea for what that. I think space solar power is not ready for commercial business case yet. No one's putting up hundreds of billions of dollars in the space solar power industry. You could have an X program, an X satellite, like an X vehicle, to do a space solar power demonstration prototype and you can challenge the NASA centers to do that demonstration of that breakthrough tech, all the technologies on order assembly of a large 100 megawatt, 50 to 100 megawatt prototype uh, satellite. They would have to have breakthroughs in on order assembly, robotic servicing, 3D manufacturing, taking, maybe taking uh, resources from the moon or asteroids or to processing and building that, it would drive breakthroughs in a whole series of technologies that never worked, it would still be a breakthrough. And they'd be buying flights of materials from Earth from commercial reusable launch vehicles as part of the process. And even if it never worked, it would be drive a bunch of breakthroughs in technologies. And if it did work, as those who are advocates of space solar power know, it would open up a huge multi-trillion dollar market for economic growth. So that's just one idea. I think that's really interesting. The important thing to note about that, I know there's a separate solar energy thing going on, but it has national security implications that are very, very serious. So you can put a movable uh, platform uh, in GeoSync that you can, uh, uh, you know, move, move around the equator and it can point up and down to different latitudes and deliver uh, high, uh, power microwave beams. Uh, you could do things like, uh, say, power U.S. troops in a remote location in Afghanistan. You could provide uh, power to uh, some folks doing humanitarian work in Africa, or you could kill everybody in the building without any evidence. Um, <laughs> that's interesting. And uh, we want the United States to have that, so I can create that support. And the other important thing that I think that's Bill and folks like that could do would be serious look at uh, nuclear space power, something that needs to be taken uh, much more seriously than we have been, although we need to not call it nuclear because it apparently scares our anti-science friends. So we'll 
called higher energy power. As someone who lived in Huntsville for over 20 years, and someone who started working in Marshall uh, in 1987 on the 75 kilowatt solar power systems with the space station, and saw what happened in Marshall. Marshall was destroyed in the 1990s. I have a lot of love for the Marshall Space Flight Center and the folks there. Uh, I was very lucky to learn about <coughs> ion propulsion at the feet of the German rocket scientists who were still around at that time. And there's an incredible cadre of incredibly capable people there in Huntsville. And, and I want to pick up on Gene's uh, uh, suggestion here. Nuclear propulsion in space and, and moving NASA back towards kind of a, a NASA model. I currently work with both uh, NASA Glenn and NASA Langley. NASA Langley is working on orbit assembly. NASA Glenn is working on ion propulsion. You could very, and there is a small nuclear propulsion group at Marshall. <clears throat> there is an incredible amount of work that could be done. I, I built the first non NASA satellite in the state of Alabama. When I was at UAH. And I had a lot of volunteers and a lot of engineering support from Marshall. But some of these guys have worked at Marshall for 10 years and they never worked on my project. They volunteered to work on my project because they said, I want to put my hands on flight hardware. And so there's a lot of really cool stuff that could be done leveraging because in space nuclear propulsion is going to open the solar system. It, it really is. Uh, high power nuclear propulsion. Uh, learning how to uh, build the machinery and 3D printing. One of my, uh, a caller of my pilot one, uh, Nikki Barkheiser at NASA, uh, Marshall is the lead on, on NASA's in-space manufacturing for 3D printing. There is a lot that could be done with these people uh, and the good folks there that have a lot of capabilities could work on that aren't directly SLS because even SLS as it transitions to a production system, most of those engineers are still going to have to find jobs doing something else because they're design and development engineers and not production engineers. And, and so there is a lot of really good stuff and, and it, it helps support the country, it helps support the economic development of the solar system that then the industry could then take and do implementation. Uh, so I, I'm very cognizant of and I'm very supportive of things that help those people, that help the nation, uh, and give the really, really good folks there at Marshall and JSC. I work with JSC too, and I'm looking at my buddy Rob there all the time. He, he's, he's my icon of JSC goodness. Because uh, there's just a lot of good people at NASA who have dedicated their lives to space, and we're not in any way, shape, form, or fashion trying to put them down, but they're just in, you know, it, it's like, um, you know, I'm a fan of the Alabama Crimson Tide and Fish football team in college football, and you know, we know, and, you know, we, you know, Auburn, poor Auburn, and some of these other colleges who don't have the leadership that Alabama has, I feel sorry for them, uh, but they need leadership, and so with NASA and leadership uh, in these things, things they can do to help support the industry, I think it will solve those problems. So I have a, a three simple things uh, to suggest. Um, the first one is uh, an appropriate federal agency that, that is uh, a lot more attuned to the needs of uh, industry. And that's the U.S. Geological Survey. The USGS doesn't get paid to go and explore new geology. They, they, work, they work for the oil and gas industry. They support, they create new opportunities for oil and gas. Money. So uh, I think that Charles has a really good analogy. If you pull examples out of the USGS and how they work, uh, NASA products operate a lot more like them. Um, the, uh, the other two things I would recommend, uh, uh, really intended to support entrepreneurs or convert a lot of those uh, workers into entrepreneurs. And I know some guys uh, at Marshall, uh, Edwin Etheridge is one of them, who is uh, very, very interested in being entrepreneurial and it's very difficult to do. Uh, even with a great deal of training, uh, the, the opportunities are limited. And, uh, and that is, uh, you know, Ralph Warner, uh, the guy you referred to in the 50s at the General Electric, uh, uh, warned us what would happen if you gave NASA an exemption from uh, U.S. patent law. They still had the exemption, and everything he said that would happen did. Uh, uh, the large the incumbents can basically steal intellectual property from small companies and in uh, the name of big NASA programs and, and, uh, and, and take it. And it's, and it's really not 
fair to the guy that, that develops that. Uh, that you know, and the other thing is uh, take a look at ITAR, make it a lot more uh, you know, uh, uh, entrepreneur friendly rather than incumbent friendly. I think the incumbents use it to, to defend markets more than they should. During the Reagan administration, the Commercial Space Launch Act was passed, and there actually was an office set up in the Department of Commerce called the Office of Space Commerce. It has a budget of $800,000 and three people working there. This is a national travel state. Uh, and you've got a commercial space business that's in the $250 uh, billion range if you count uh, the telecommunications and the TV businesses. We need to take that office seriously, as well as FAA's AST office should, should be moved back up to report to the Secretary of Transportation and his budget, which includes the mandate to promote uh, and facilitate commercial space, should be increased significantly. It's not all about NASA. Just for those of you who don't know, it, the predecessor to NASA was the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, and it was established in 1915 by an act of Congress with a massive budget of 5,000 a year for the first five years to help get out of that problem, that quagmire of non-competitiveness that the U.S. got itself into. So, that, and, and there's been a lot of discussion about that model, so I just want to make sure that everybody kind of knew what we were, what we were talking about. I do have to say I've spent a lot of time digging through the NASA budget, both uh, the current one and, and historically, and looking at space station, other projects. International partners were brought in often to exercise American soft power, to demonstrate our goodwill to the world and, and, and to make the U.S. look better. But more often than not, the U.S. footed the bill. And very often, we were paying the bill to fly an astronaut from some other country on a Russian rocket to go to a space station that we paid 100 billion out of 130 billion for and call it the International Space Station. And then you want to go and commercialize this International Space Station. Suddenly you have all these, these vested interest groups that want to tell you what you can and can't do uh, in an attempt to do that. So I don't think NASA has actually managed the international partnerships as good as NASA has made them look. Uh, we need to be careful with that. We need to bring international partners in, make them step up, make them pony up, and pay their own share, and we'd love to have it. As the guy who was one of the original two co-founders of NanoRack, which is the leader in commercializing the International Space Station, I know a thing or two about what you can do. Um, if your purpose is economic development growth, you would never let a government agency be in charge of the infrastructure. That's the foundation of the economic development growth. Um, you would go maybe towards a more NACA type role where you're partnering with industry and industry is the lead. You notice NACA didn't design and develop any of the airplanes from their existence in 1915 until, you know, for many decades. They let industry lead that and they partnered with them and helped them solve specific technical problems. You would take that same philosophy to space stations with privately owned and operated space stations, with NASA being a customer, like an airman, and a partner in solving any specific space station technical problems they may have. And so that's a completely different philosophy. And you would let the commercial industry owner operators decide whether to include other international partners in there, which actually industry is very good at. They will have international partners who are commercial companies who would be partners with the network in their uh, space station. So I think that uh, it, it actually you will get a lot more economic growth and a lot more commercial value dollar to dollar in this commission with that. And that's, I, so I would not take the NISS international partnership any further. I think it uh, should not be used again. The Muir Space Station, the uh, space halves that America put up before the International Space Station and the International Space Station are architectural alignments on a part of the pyramids. And we've had a nasty habit of taking these astonishing architectural achievements and letting them dissipate in the atmosphere. Um, they have to be kept alive. Humans do tourism in order to go see sites. And what are sites? Sites are generally historic monuments that are unique. Um, generally, they're unique because they're higher than anything else around. Well, what's higher than every single building on Earth, including the Burj Dubai, the International Space Station? So it is incumbent upon us to keep these things alive and in space for the rest of humanity's existence. Second, we've learned a lesson from the International Space Station. Cooperation 
does not work, competition does. We had a space race with the Russians in the late 1950s, and it produced our space program. Um, then we had the giant cooperation of the International Space Station. It put our imaginations to sleep. What Charles just outlined a few minutes ago was a new space race. And it's a new space race between Jeff Bezos and um, Elon Musk. That excites the human spirit. We need more of these competitions, more of these space races. If the National Hockey League decided that 22 players on the ice should cooperate in making a snowman, how many people would tune in to a hockey game? It's the competition that keeps us glued to the screen. We need competition in space. One of the, the values of the International Space Station, even though it's an incredibly mundane thing, is the standard of position. We had countries from all over the world that built hardware, and the hardware didn't come together until it got into space. And it worked. The uh, CDMs, the Russian docking uh, system, the different modules and all, that was actually, and this is something, we don't know this in our history anymore because we don't study history, uh, but my great-grandfather was uh, the head of the Master Mechanics and Master Car Builders Association. One of the things that held American railroads back was the lack of standardization in the 1870s and the 1880s. And it was actually a, the standardization around the Westinghouse air brake that really allowed American uh, railroading to explode. And so this is another value that NASA can bring to the table to help, which is to, and, and like what you're talking about uh, with the rocket engine, okay, that, that's a major simplification. Somebody didn't drive, put out a requirement that said you have to use a turbo for mechanical turbo pump. They just went and did it, but it's still a rocket engine, has all the same characteristics. So these types of things with standardization and continual incremental improvements, uh, I think will make a lot of difference. The, the suggestion is to propose for Alabama and the other centers of space excellence. Um, that we build a highway in the sky, and then we make a laundry list of the things that are needed for that highway, and those things include gas stations. ULA has the lead on that, but that doesn't mean other people in Alabama can't propose options and uh, get into the race. It includes uh, service vehicles for the moon and for Mars. Most important, it includes robotic mining facilities for the moon, Mars, and asteroids, and it includes these uh, legendary ISRU units, the units to turn water um, into uh, hydrogen and oxygen, rocket fuel, breathable uh, air, and uh, drinkable water, and ultimately to take even the carbon from the Martian atmosphere and turn it into plastics that can then be run through a 3D printer so we can do all our construction with Mars materials on the Martian surface. That's a recommendation from Dennis Bushnell, the chief scientist, research scientist, and NASA Langley, who was a friend. Those, that's the laundry list that I would propose to the people at NASA and give them some angel investor type people to help guide them in uh, starting their own entrepreneurial businesses to compete for these things with NASA as what Bruce often calls an anchor tenant, um, with NASA as the chief customer, um, so that money can go into, uh, into Alabama um, for useful work that does things that Jeff Bezos and, and Elon Musk are never going to be able to do on their own. I think the point is SLS is going to uh, continue. We want to use it as effectively as we can. You'll notice many people uh, in the commercial space flight world have uh, come to realization that uh, continuing to fight this battle attack against the castle is, is not the effective way to move commercial space interests forward. It's not about having an office. It's about uh, working together to get what we need to get done. If SLS flies to Europe and saves us a few years and does some great science and we think it's too expensive, so be it. Uh, it it's still going to happen. Those people in Alabama are not giving up their jobs on an existing thing that they can see that has strong political backing in exchange for making plastics out of carbon dioxide on the water someday in the future. That needs to be the second thing that happens because there will be a day when there isn't an SLS, just like there was a day when there wasn't a space shuttle. People in California didn't have anything to do about that, but people in Alabama, we need to have that solution. So we need to be working at this forward going step, but we need to be realistic about where we are today, with the programs that exist today, and not just spend all your time fighting on that.
So on that note, if you do you have some final comment, I do. Uh, and uh, you know, I'm not an expert. The mining guy, uh, but uh, I will uh, ask the question: Is SLS a symptom or is it a problem? And uh, I think it may be uh, a symptom. I think the problem is that uh, NASA gets the couriers half finished, and then people come in and cancel. Them. And you got to stop that at some point in time. Uh, uh, if you want to, uh, in not being a rocket guy, right? so you know, uh, I, I have no opinion. I have no expertise about what that rocket is or how it's built or whatever. What I'm about to say is possible, but uh, you know, reusability is a big thing. I remember when Gene Myers was really excited about the extra tank, which is part of the science, and uh, he made big arguments about going in there and automating things like the current building uh, system. Uh, and, and he was really excited about using reusing that infrastructure for human habitation. There, there could be additional uses. If you want to get shelly eating out of your hand, like you know, deer eating the seed corn, uh, give them more uses for SLS than they can handle. Okay, on that note, please help me out.